Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God, saved from the chastening rod. Seek the way we cross, try. Christians are And my day is coming In the morning Oh, I know many gonna be there Do Lord And the trumpet will sound Oh, and all of the dead Lord, and the righteous Gonna meet my Lord And we'll go So many cold losing their homes of gold. This in God's word is told. Evils abound. Lord, when these signs come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast. Trumpet.
Uh, let us bear in mind all of those on our prayer list. Uh, continue to pray for everyone that we keep on our continued prayer list. We have many who have lost uh, loved ones due to COVID. We have many who are battling cancer. We have many who are, uh, who are uh, in financial um, hardships. So we want to pray for everyone, everyone um, that we can think of to, to ask for prayer uh, and lift their name up to God and, and believing that God will answer the prayers of the righteous and that he will heed those prayers and give those on our list the things that they so need uh, right now in their life. Church, let us continue to pray. Also, pray for, uh, unfortunately, the, the young man, young 15-year-old man, young man was murdered, gunned down um, just a couple of days ago. And so I would ask that you pray for, I don't know his name, don't know his family, but I just know that a mother and a father has lost a 15-year-old son. So let us pray for that family. Let us pray, church, for all of our young people. Uh, they are faced with some things in this world and in this life that, church, we perhaps didn't have to deal with. And so let's pray for our young people. Let's keep them lifted up and encourage them um, as best we can. And that they give their lives to the Lord and that they live their lives to the glory of our Father. Church, I am excited to be with you. I'm glad you're with us. I'm ready to worship. I, I'm sure you are. Let's worship God together. Sopranos, help me sing. I love you forever. Oh, 
traveling uh, by sea. She was traveling uh, by on a ship that was taking her from England to the United States. And she was on her way to see her daughter, to spend some time with her daughter. And they began to have trouble with the ship. They began to have some problems and everyone on the ship began to become nervous. They were frantic, they were screaming and yelling and wondering what was going on, hoping that everything would be all right. And notice over to the side in her seat was this woman calmly resting ashore. And one of the passengers said, ma'am, why, why are you so calm? Uh, why are you uh, uh, so uh, in control of your emotions and everything that, it, uh, in spite of everything that is going on, the ship may very well sink, and you're still calm. Why is that? The lady said, well, first, I'm a child of God. And she says, what that means is, she said, and secondly, I am on my way to see my daughter. She says, I have two daughters. One of my daughters is already in heaven. And she said, the other daughter I'm going to see in the United States. She said, therefore, since I am a child of God, and I believe in the promises of God, she says, one way or the other, I'm going to see my daughters. She said, if the ship does not fold and if the ship uh, stays intact, then I'll see my daughter in these United States. But she said, but if perchance the ship does not make it, if perchance the ship will, will break apart and it will fail to reach its destination and we perish in these seas, she said, one thing I know is that I will see my daughter who is in heaven. I need you to understand, church, what she was articulating to the passenger who had asked her the question was that I am resting on the promises of God. I am resting on the promise that I have eternal life. I am resting and trusting on the promise that I will, uh, will be with my Father in heaven. I am resting on the promise that I will see loved ones again. I am press, uh, resting and trusting and standing on the promise of life after this physical life. I am standing on the promise that after all, even if I meet my demise on this ship and in these seas, she says, I will, I will not meet my demise in seeing my Savior. As a matter of fact, if I die here in this sea, it does not mean it is the end of me. I am going to live again, and I live with my Savior. What am I trying to suggest to you, my dear friends, is that when you find yourself troubled by the cares of this world, when you find yourself bothered by life and the things that go on in life, when you find yourself uh, 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 be bewildered by why you see what you see and how our people are being attacked, how young people are losing their lives every day of the minute. When we are in this pandemic for almost two years now and it seems like things are getting worse instead of getting better, one thing the child of God can do and must do is stand and rest on the promises of Almighty God. The Hebrew writer would suggest to us that that's the very thing he wanted to get across to these Christians in Hebrews chapter 6. He had already given them a warning in the beginning verses of chapter 6 and had been encouraging them in the latter part of chapter 6 verse 9 to, to make sure they continue to stay strong in the Lord and continue to work in the Lord because God will not go to sleep on their labor. God will not forget uh, what they have done and are doing as children of God for one another. He encourages them to do the right thing even in the midst of persecution. And the only reason you can do the right thing 
in persecution. The only reason you can do what's pleasing to God when you are in adversity is when you understand that you rest on the promises of Almighty God. Notice he encourages them by the fidelity of God. Listen, church, if we're going to, if we're going to be victorious, if we're going to, if we're going to move into the, into the things that God has for us and we're going to receive the blessings God has for us and we're going to be the people that God has destined us to be if we're going to trans have our lives transformed then you have to trust in the fidelity of Almighty God he encourages them by the victorious faith of others who had gone on before them who had lived the life of faith and he says you can piggyback you can borrow uh, and the example of other Christians who had lived by faith. But now, in chapter 6, verse 13, he's going to encourage them to stay faithful to God by trusting not only in the fidelity of God, but in the promises of God. Now notice, the first thing he does is he encourages them on the certain, based on the certainty of God's promise. Now notice it's verse 13. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he, Abraham, obtained the promise. <coughs> now notice, he says, God, excuse me, God made promise. You remember in Genesis chapter 15, uh, excuse me, Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 16 and 17, and even in Genesis chapter 22, God renews the promise with Abraham. And you remember, God had already told him in the earlier chapters that, listen, you are going to have a son according to promise. You will have a son uh, and Abraham did not quite understand how God was going to bring about this promise. And you know the story. God then uh, uh, commands Abraham to trust in this promise. I'm going to make your seed great and all in your seed all of the nations of the earth and families of the earth will be blessed. And did you remember seeing Sarah had uh, come up with a plan to have a child? Because they didn't quite understand how are we going to have a child at such an old age? And so they came humanly, tried to figure it out for God. And they 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 had they come with they, she brings her handmaiden Hagar to, to Abram. He sleeps with her, but he has a son by the name of Ishmael. But that wasn't the son, and that wasn't how God was going to bring about such a worldwide blessing uh, uh, into this world. Well, uh, God then tells them again that you're going to have a son. And he says, I want you to go out and number the stars. I want you to look at the stars, Abraham, and I want you to see if, tell me if you can count them. He says, and that's how great a number of your seeds will be. Well, uh, I'm pretty sure Abraham still quite did, uh, he didn't quite understand the totality and the fullness of God's promise at that time. Well, uh, God then blesses them at a uh, at hundred years old. He blesses them to have a son by the name of Isaac. And then you remember what takes place uh, after Isaac gets to a certain age. God then comes to Abraham and he commands Abraham to offer up his son, that son which would be according to the promise. Offer this son uh, as a sacrifice to me. And you remember Abraham, he walks up, he and a few of his comrades, and they are walking up to the mountain. He tells them to wait here, but me and the lad, we will go and worship God. You remember that? We will go and worship God. But then he says, we will come back. <laughs> We'll come back. And Abraham had him. And by the time you get from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 22, Abraham, walking with God, trusting God, had built up enough faith in the promises of God that he was more than willing to offer up his son Isaac uh, as a sacrifice. 
to God. But then Abraham had enough faith in God by this time, enough faith in the promises of God and the surety of God's promises that God would even bring his son back from the dead. And you remember after Abraham gets ready to bring the knife down upon his son, the angel of the Lord stops Abraham and he says, now I know uh, Abraham some things about you. I know that you are faithful to me. You are loyal to me. But then notice what God does after staying the hand and after Abraham sees the ram caught in the thickets that would take the place of his son Isaac. Notice what God says to him. Verse 15 says, of Genesis chapter 22, verse 15, says the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from the heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will, multi I will greatly bless you and will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Notice again, verse 16, God says, and by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. Now, when we come back here, the Hebrew writer says, when God made that promise, the promise we just read in Genesis chapter 22, the promise we'll read in chapter 12, 15, 16, 17, he says, when God made that promise to Abraham, he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. In other words, God says, here is the promise, Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless that your seed be great. I'm going to multiply you in such a way, Abraham, that you will have a worldwide blessing that will come through your loins. It will bless the world, not just your family and not just the Israelite family, but through your seed, Abraham, I'm going to do a great thing, and that would be to save the entire world. Well, now, God says, but I'm promising this to you, Abraham, but here is what I want you to understand. There was no one else greater than me that I could swear by. There was no one else greater than me, mightier than me, had, a, had more integrity than me in order for me to swear by to make sure my promise would be good in your life. God says what I had to do, I had to swear by myself. I had to bring it over by myself. Uh, when, I, when I compared my promise, I could only compare me bringing about this promise to myself, to my own character. I could only put my integrity, my character on the witness stand that I would make good on my promise. Let me just tell you, church, you ought to be glad, you ought to shout, you ought to give God praise because there is no one greater that can give a promise like God who can keep promises the way God can keep promises, who has the power to bring about the promises of God. God says, I swear I can find no one else greater than me, so I swore by myself. He says you can trust in the certainty of God's promise. Here is why Abraham shows what it looks like to have confidence in God and in what God promises. Now verse 14 says, he, get, he, 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 he elucidates on the promise, or he, he quotes the promise that God had given to Abraham. But then he says, the Hebrew writer, so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. And, and now, he didn't see the promise come into his fruition. He didn't see the fullness of that promise, but yet he waited on what God had promised patiently. Our biggest problem oftentimes, 
as to why we miss the blessings of God, why we miss the spiritual things of God, and why we, 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 uh, we, we make decisions and choices that go against the will of God is because we do not like waiting, and sometimes we have a problem even waiting on God. He said, wait. He waited patiently and he obtained the promise. Now watch this. Four men, verse 16, four men swear by one greater than themselves and with them an oath is given as confirmation and it is an end to every dispute. So now he says, listen, you understand this when you read my letter. You understand this human to human. Humans make oaths or they give promises. He says, but what is backed up by the promise is an oath. And you often swear by someone greater than yourself. He says, so uh, the oath is brought along to give strength to the promise. The oath gives power. It gives weight to the promise. And so it, it is designed the oath is to confirm the promise and to cut out any dispute, any doubt to as to whether or not the promiser will be able to keep his promise. So now, I hope you see this, church. He's saying to us, as the Hebrew writer writes this, he says, you can have true faith and stand on the promises of God because God backs up his promise with an oath. God puts weight on his promise by not just simply saying what he's going to do, but he gives an oath to what he's going to do. He is going to confirm with his oath so that you and I will never doubt his promise. You and I will never uh, speculate about what God can do concerning his promise. He says God is making sure you put absolute faith and trust in what he said and I'm going to back it up by my own. What person do you know can do such a thing, church? What person? And let me just tell you this. Let me tell you this because we're going to see this a little further. The promise that he made to Abraham is still good today. He made it not just, look at how good God is. He made the oath or the promise to Abraham. But it wasn't just to be for Abraham. It was to be for those who would be heirs of Abraham. Well, what do we know about this? God's oath to Abraham was confirmed by his very own existence. God's promises to Abraham were blessings and descendants. I'm going to bless you and it's going to be through descendants that would ultimately bless the world. Then he says Abraham received everything God promised by waiting patiently for him, for them, for the promises of God to Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 17 and Genesis chapter 22. I need to say that so, so those of you who are taking note, when you, you want to see God reiterate that promise to Abraham, you look at Genesis 12, you look at Genesis 15, you look at Genesis 17, uh, and Genesis chapter 22. Now, God's promise then, church, is backed up by his oath, which means God is credible to keep his promise. He is putting his character, his integrity on the witness stand so that you will have complete faith in what God promised, right? So now, notice what he says in verse 17. He says, in the same way, God desiring, let's read verse 16 again so that you can get it. It, it would read better. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath is given as confirmation is an end to every dispute. Well, in the same way, God desiring even more to show the heirs of promise, watch it church, the unchangeableness of his purpose. He entered 
interpose <coughs> with and oh, he says so just like men make promises and they back it up with an oath, he says God desired even more to show us the promise who would be heir. Let me just let you in on a secret. That's us. Every child of God, every person that has put faith in the Lord Jesus, you have obeyed the gospel. Everyone that is in Christ, God desired to show us the fullness of his promise. So this wasn't just for Abraham. It was for us as well. He says, but let me tell you about this promise. He says, God wanted to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. Now, another translation when it says purpose, or another translation says immutability for unchangeableness, and when it comes to purpose, the, another translation may say counsel. So what does that mean? It means, church, it means when God took counsel, when God made promise, he, 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 he interposed his promise with an oath. Watch this. It means, church, God, he went to interpose, he confirms what he promised by, in, by interjecting himself as a mediator. So, what God does, God makes promise. There's no one greater than God for him to swear by, so he swears by himself. So God then interpo he interposes with an oath by standing as a mediator between himself and those who would be heirs to the promise. God, look at how awesome God is. God says there is no one greater than me, no one who, can, who, who has the integrity that I have, no one who can maintain and keep this promise like me. So therefore, I'm going to serve as a mediator between myself and those who would be heirs. God said to shut up all the disputing, to shut down all doubting, to clear up what may be unclear. God says, I'm going to put myself between myself and man so that there will be no doubting. There will be absolutely no confusion as to whether or not I can bring about my promise. He said, I am going to show you just how much or how capable I am of giving a promise more than 2,000 years ago to a man named Abraham. And I'm going to show you how more than capable I am of keeping that promise even for those in the 21st century. Boy, we got we to show up awesome God. God says, my promise is, was good then to Abraham and is still good now. As long as men continue to give their lives to Jesus Christ, they are actually taking advantage of the promise God promised to Abraham. So when he says to church, when he says he wants to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness, right, the immutability of his purpose, his counsel, he interposed it. He stood in and confirmed it with a oath. Now, what it means, let me give you the definition. To confirm it means to act as a mediator between two litigating or covenanting parties. It means to stand in place to accomplish something by interposing between two parties. That's what God did. God stepped in between himself and the other party, which would be us, to make sure he accomplished the, pur the, the, uh, the purpose. Now, the other thing is, God confirmed his promise with no other, with no one else, in order that the heirs would find refuge in Jesus Christ. That means God pledged, watch this church, God pledged himself to give surety of the purpose, of the promise. God placed himself between himself and the heirs and takes himself to the witness stand to prove how capable he is and how willing he is to bring about the promise.
what, what is the Hebrew writer saying? You can stand on the certainty of God's promise. So now, so now, notice, he says, in the same way God desired to show more to the heirs of promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed within oath, so that, watch this, two unchangeable things in which is, it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken refuge would have strong consolation or encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. So now he says, here's the reason God made promise and backed it up with an oath. Because this promise and this oath is unchangeable. Therefore, God is unchangeable. And because the oath and the promise is unchangeable, it renders God impossible to lie because he backed up his oath by the promise. Or he backed up the promise, should I say, by his oath. And therefore, his character must, it limits and restricts God from doing anything other than making good on his promise. I'm trying to tell you, church, you can stand on the certainty of God's promise because he backed it up with an oath. You can even say God is backing up his promise with his integrity. He is backing up his promise with his character. He says, and so there are two unchangeable things. The promise, now church, Get this in your spirit. Two unchangeable things. What are they? The promise and the oath. So just as sure as God promised to Abraham that in his seed all nations and families of the earth would be blessed, that's the promise. Guess what? The promise is unchangeable. And God backed it up by an oath. He interposed. He served as the mediator of himself between himself and the heir. That will not change. That too is unchangeable. And here's the other thing. What makes also uh, the icing on the cake with this is that God cannot lie. That is also unchangeable. Church, y'all, I'm trying to stay I'm trying to stay, uh, uh, contain myself. But church, I just get happy when I understand that God's promise is unchangeable. God's oath backed up the promise. It's also unchangeable. And God, in his character, doesn't change, cannot lie. That is unchangeable. Church, if that doesn't fuel and motivate and invigorate your faith, I don't know what else will. I know that we have an unchangeable God who gives an unchangeable promise, who backs it up with an unchangeable oath. And church, we can keep our faith in no matter what the situation, no matter how tough it is, no matter how big the problem, one thing's for certain, God will still be constant. He will still be the same God that he was yesterday, that he is today, and that he will be forevermore. Thank God for his unchangeableness. Yeah, yeah. He puts an end to all of these arguments and doubts, church. God puts an end. And here's how you know that that promise that God was making to Abraham or made to Abraham is good today. You got to read Galatians chapter 3. Matter of fact, let's just turn there so I can prove it to you. Let's just turn there. Galatians chapter 3. Notice verse number 6. Gal Galatians chapter 3. I want to read more than this, but look at Galatians chapter 3 verse 6. He said, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Mm. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Did not tell you you were an heir. Did not tell you the Hebrew writer said God desired to show more, even more so to the heirs of the promise what he was doing and what he's going to accomplish through Abraham. He says, 
the scripture foresee that God would justify the Gentiles how? By faith. Now you begin to see the worldwide fulfillment of God's promise. That God wasn't just talking to Abraham concerning this promise. He wasn't just saying that this promise would be good for the Israelite. God was saying this promise goes even further into the lives of those who are not Jews. I want to also say the Gentile and every person who is a human being who will ever dare to put faith in Jesus Christ, repent of their sin, be baptized into Christ. He said those are the people who will be heirs to Abraham. According to the promise. Watch this. Scripture foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All nations will be blessed in you. Now, so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are, are, as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide, abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now drop down, drop down, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order, in, in, that, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Christ removed the curse of the law, the penalty that comes with the law, so that the blessing would come on us. We are Gentile. It comes upon us, the blessing of Abraham through the promise of Almighty God. Now notice this. Notice this. He says, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentile, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it had been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds as referring to many, but to one, to your seed, that is Christ. What am I saying? Is this the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise? For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise, church. What then? Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Thank you, Jesus, that Jesus took away the law, that, as, that when God was preaching the gospel to Abraham, he was showing that through your seed, would come to see Jesus Christ. Yeah, so you can be encouraged on the certainty, church, of God's promise. That means God will not change his position as to his promise, and whatever promise God has made, God will stand by it. Yeah, yeah, he will stand by it. Look at verse, now look, at, look at verse 19. Look at verse 19, church. He says, this is the hope. Now, now, in verse the latter part of verse 18, he says, this was done so that we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. That strong refuge, church, to escape the wrath of God, the penalty of sin, which is death. He says, we take refuge in this hope. Now, the hope is in, that we're going to ultimately see will be Jesus Christ himself. So notice, he says, you can have confidence uh, in the certainty of God's promise and you can have confidence in the steadfastness of God's 
purpose. So now notice, he says, so that two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This is the hope we have, watch this church, as an anchor. Look at this. We have this hope as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast. He says this hope. Now what does he mean by this hope? This hope that we have, this hope is a anchor, write that down. It is a anchor to the soul or of the soul. Mm -hmm. This anchor will give stability like it gives stability to a ship. Our anchor, our hope is the anchor of our soul. Now watch it now. So when he says this anchor is a couple of things. This anchor, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, this hope is both sure. Look at that. It is sure, firm. It is rooted in the fidelity of God and not in our performance. So church, Yes, you may be imperfect. You may not be all together. You may not do everything right all the time. That it, but God's promise and the fidelity of God is not based on your performance, but on the firmness, the steadfastness, the surety of Almighty God. So then the other part of this, uh, this hope we have as an anchor is that it is steadfast. Now, what does he mean by it being steadfast or us? And then he says, it is also strong. Now, watch this. It is both sure and steadfast and the one which enters the veil. Now, let me back up to verse 18 again. I'm getting ahead of myself. So that two unchangeable things, which is an impossible for God to lie, we have taken refuge and have strong encouragement. To take hold of the hope set before us. This hope is an anchor. What am I taking hold of? The hope set before us. What about this hope? This hope is sure and this hope is steadfast and this hope goes into or beyond the veil. Now watch this. When he talks about having strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us, he means it is an indwelling strength. It is embodied in us. It is put forth either aggressively or as an obstacle to resist the way an army or a fortress resists its enemy. So what the Hebrew writer is saying to us, he is saying based on the unchangeableness of God's character, the unchangeableness of God's promise, the unchangeableness of God's oath, he says, it gives us strong encouragement. It gives us the ability to be resistant. The ability like an army and a fortress to keep out doubt. God gives us strength based on his promise, his oath, and his character so that we would lay hold of the hope set before us and it will serve as an anchor to our soul. It will serve as a mighty fortress, an army that's ready to resist doubt, pessimism, skepticism, uh, and all kind of philosophy and lies about Christ. He says everything God has put in front of us and backed up with his oath and his character, he says you can lay hold of this hope with surety. Because it's God who promised it, it's God who backs it up with his oath, and it's God whose character and integrity is on the line. Now notice this, church. Notice this. He says, he says, the hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope to be sure, steadfast, and one which enters the veil. Where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest according to the uh, uh, order of Melchizedek. So he says the hope that I'm talking about, the hope that is sure, 
the hope that is steadfast, the hope that went behind the veil, just like the veil that separated the uh, God's people from God's presence, and that only the high priest could go in and enter. He said that veil by the blood of Jesus Christ has now been torn and ripped. And now we have full and continuous access to our God. And it's the hope that went beyond the veil. It's the hope that now sits in heaven for us. It's the hope that we grab onto that's in heaven. Now notice, our anchor usually keeps you in one place. It doesn't move. But the hope we have is the anchor that's in heaven. I'm so thankful because when you grab hold to the hope that's in heaven, guess what it's going to do? It ain't going to keep you here on this old wretched earth. It's going to pull you up to heaven. I'm trying to get you excited about Jesus. What I'm telling you is the hope that we have, spiritually speaking, in Jesus Christ is an anchor that you can grab onto and it pulls you up from sin. It pulls you up from uh, negative people. It pulls you up from thinking despondently and thinking uh, 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 church negatively and, and, and pessimistically. It keeps your church happy and hopeful and joyful in Jesus Christ because you know that one day all of this will be over and I will grab hold, I will maintain my grip on the hope that's actually in heaven is Jesus Christ himself. And it's the anchor keeps me steadfast. It's the anchor that'll keep me sure in my faith, church. Let me tell you, when the storms of life may batter you, you still are anchored. When the adverse winds of affliction may blow against you, you are still anchored. And when the waves of adversity may crash into your vessel, you are still anchored. It doesn't matter what comes your way. <laughs> You are still anchored in the Lord. Doesn't matter how hard the winds of life blows. I'm still holding on to the anchor that's in heaven. Are y'all hearing me, church? So this anchor is firm, it's secure, and it's penetrated because it penetrates the veil where God is. Heaven itself. Yeah, our hope is actually Jesus, church. That's our hope. But you understand that I can stand on the promises, the certainty of God's promise, and I can stand on the constancy of God's purpose. Church, the devil, the devil can, cannot pull you off of that. And when you've got the right grip of faith in the anchor that has gone beyond the veil and now resides in heaven itself, Jesus himself, Oh, church, with the right grip, nothing can pull you away from it. With the right grip, no one can deter you from letting go. When you've got your, your grip on the anchor of the soul, which is Jesus Christ himself, my God, nothing can move you. Nothing can move you. Nothing can move you. And keep you from holding on to Jesus Christ. Who is our forerunner? The Hebrew writer said. My dear friends, I pray that you all have been enlightened. I pray that you have come to understand how important it is to stand on the promises of God. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that church, i tell you something else. When you go back and you read Hebrews chapter 6, I'm going to tell you something else. It speaks to the certainty of our salvation. You can be sure of your salvation. And you can be sure you are going to heaven. That's, that's, what, that's what the Hebrew writer is trying to get us to see. When you, when you are anchored in Christ, when you, are, when you are holding on to the promises of God, when you understand that God backs up what he promised, by his character and his oath. And then when you recognize that the promise he made to Abraham is good, he's making good on that promise even right now. 
Church, you, who else, who else do you know can keep a promise more than 2,000 years ago like God? No one. That's who you put faith in. I pray that you will put your faith in Jesus Christ, the anchor of your soul. I pray that you repent, turn from this world, give your life to Jesus, be immersed into Christ in the water and grave of baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. And let Jesus be the anchor of your soul. God bless you. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away, rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight.
that was also delivered unto you. The Lord Jesus, the same that was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do, remembrance of me. After the same master of the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is New Testament in my blood, this do ye, as often as ye drink it, remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. At this time, let's go to Heavenly Father and pray on behalf of the bread. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, Lord, as you to bless us, Lord, take part of this bread, and present the Son's broken body. Hope, Lord, we take it in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Now let's pray for the cup. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, Lord, take part of this fruit of the vine, and present the Son's shed in blood. Hope, Lord, we take it with clean hands and pure heart. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. That now concludes the Lord's Supper. We now come to the portion of our worship service, which is the collecting of contributions. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, began first verse, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered you, that there be no gatherings when I come. You have multiple opportunities to give at this time. We have our text to give. We have our secure lockbox located on the outside of the church building where you can actually come and drop your collection off. And if you want to, you can actually mail your contribution in. Our address, 1709 Staley Avenue, Savannah, Georgia, 31404, 31405. So, as you see, you have multiple opportunities to give. So at this time, let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer on behalf of all those who have given. Our dear kind, merciful Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we come before at this time, Lord, as you continue to bless all those who gave. Heavenly Father, we ask you to continue to bless all those, Lord, who desire to give, Lord, but unfortunately weren't able to at this particular time. We hope we continue to use your, this money, Heavenly Father, for the up and your kingdom here on earth. In our Jesus' precious name we do pray. Amen. Well, church, that brings us to a close. I want to say you go be encouraged, be strong in the Lord, and trust in the promises of God. Join me in prayer. Father God, we are a people who are going to trust in your promises. We're going to be a people who will trust in your character, knowing that you make good on everything that you promise. Father, we're going to pray that uh, we be strengthened and invigorated in our faith by the promises you made to Abraham. Because we know now that we are heirs of such promise, that we are now reaping the benefits of that promise. Father, we thank you for your wisdom. We thank you, Father, for your providence in bringing this all about through Jesus Christ. Father, we pray and ask for your continued uh, hand of comfort and, and healing upon those on our sick and afflicted list. Father, we pray and ask for comfort right now on the family who lost their 15-year-old son. We pray, dear God, uh, for clarity and for and to help us understand, Father, that the devil is at work. When we see senseless violence like this, the devil is at work. And Father, help us to be a church that combats the devil and fight him head on. Father, we give you glory and honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My dear friends, and have a wonderful, wonderful week. And remember, stand on the certainty of God's promise. I love you. There's a message true and glad. For the sinful and the sad, bring it out, bring it out, you will give them all courage new, it will help them to be true.
save me. 